Family, friends, and colleagues bid a sad farewell to Officer Christine Peters. Funeral services were held today for the Greenbelt police officer. The 49-year-old died last week, days after being critically injured while investigating a crash. A passing vehicle struck Peters on Edmonston Road. She was a Greenbelt police officer for nearly two decades. Meantime, Maryland's COVID numbers continue to spike. The state reports nearly 2,400 new cases today. This brings the state's total case count to more than 336,000. An additional 57 Marylanders have died from the virus. Currently, 1,700 residents are hospitalized with COVID-19. County Health Officer Dr. Ernest Carter updates the Prince George's delegation about the state of its COVID-19 vaccination program. Patricia Vallone has more on this morning's meeting. Prince George's County Health Officer Dr. Ernest Carter says the county is still in a critical state with a positivity rate above 10 percent. Now, he says the county is giving an average of 1,000 COVID-19 vaccinations daily and that it is critical to maintain enough vaccine for the required second dose. Carter says the county is trying to weed out residents from other jurisdictions, but there are occasions where non-residents can get the vaccine. For example, if an elderly resident has moved into your home during the pandemic. Health officials are trying to resolve concerns about seniors and those with disabilities being able to get to the vaccination sites. There are currently three mobile units under development. Staff is currently training to run those units. Carter says those Prince George's residents who have pre-registered will not lose their place in line and that the county will reach out to them when more vaccine is available. Maryland is planning to add big pharmacy chains to the list of vaccine clinics, and the county may consider alternate sites such as grocery stores or independent pharmacies. The county is planning to add a hotline for vaccine registrations with about two dozen staffers to man the lines and help seniors or those without internet register for the vaccine. A new site for residents of South County will open on Monday. It will allow an additional 500 vaccinations to be given daily. Another site in North County is expected to open in the next two weeks. It will bring the total number of vaccinations daily to 2,500. Reporting from home, I'm Patricia Vallone, CTV News. Dr. Carter wants to make sure that residents know the vaccine is free. The county only asks for health insurance information to get reimbursement from insurance companies. He emphasizes that it is illegal to ask for a copay and that you do not need insurance to get tested or to get a vaccine. Governor Larry Hogan is putting pressure on all school districts in Maryland to return to hybrid learning no later than March 1st, or they may face consequences. Hogan made the announcement during a news conference yesterday afternoon, during which State Superintendent of Schools Dr. Karen Salmon received her COVID-19 vaccine. The new guidance calls for daily in-person learning for students with disabilities. Elementary and secondary schools would return to hybrid or phase daily in person. As a point of reference, Hogan cited teachers in other states who face legal ramifications and pay freezes for refusing to reopen schools. The governor did not want to go that route, but he suggested he could. I want to make it perfectly clear. I will do everything I possibly can do within the law to push to get all of Maryland's children back into the classrooms. And I call on every leader in the state to join me and President Joe Biden in making this an immediate priority. Meantime, the president of the county teachers union says Governor Hogan is misleading the public when it comes to school reopenings in Maryland. Teresa Dudley with the Prince George's County Educators Association says teachers want to go back to in-person learning, but it's not the time. She says staff will start receiving vaccinations February 1st, but it's not safe to reopen right now. We have to look and see what the me me metric, metric says. We have to see what the spread rate is. And we're way above that based on what the, the information that I received and I receive every day from the school system. So I, I, don't, I don't think March 1st is, is a magical date and to try to threaten people um, is, is, is just bad government. Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer says the House will deliver an article of impeachment against President Trump on Monday, clearing the way for the start of Trump's second trial. The House impeached Trump on a single article of incitement of insurrection following the January 6 riots at the Capitol. Republicans want to delay the start of the trial until mid-February to give Trump more time to prepare his case.
There will be a trial, and when that trial ends, senators will have to decide if they believe Donald John, Donald John Trump incited the erection, insurrection against the United States. This impeachment began with an unprecedentedly fast and minimal process over in the House. The sequel cannot be an insufficient Senate process that denies former President Trump his due process or damages the Senate or the presidency itself. Schumer is pushing back on arguments that a trial of a president who has already left office would be unconstitutional. Democrats are seeking to convict Trump and bar him from holding federal office again. U.S. Capitol Police launch an investigation after a Maryland lawmaker sets off a metal detector near the House chamber. Representative Andy Harris, who represents Maryland's first congressional district, was carrying a concealed weapon near the House chamber when the metal detector went off. The magnometer was installed following the January 6th insurrection. Members of the public are not allowed to carry guns on Capitol grounds, but members of Congress may keep firearms in their offices or transport them on Capitol grounds if they are unloaded or, excuse me, and securely wrapped. Lawmakers are not allowed to bring guns in either the House or Senate chambers. A retired four-star Army general becomes the first African-American to run the Department of Defense. Lloyd Austin today was confirmed as the new Secretary of Defense. He was approved in a 93-2 vote. There were concerns that Austin hadn't been out of uniform long enough to hold the position. The National Security Act of 1947 requires a mandatory seven years. Austin, who retired back in 2016, was given a waiver by the House just yesterday. You're watching CTV News. I'm Keisha Butts. We'll be back in a moment. For the latest information on COVID-19 in Maryland, visit the State Health Department website. That's health.maryland.gov. Again, health.maryland.gov. Click the link to the COVID-19 information portal. There you'll find all the latest information about coronavirus. You'll find daily updates on cases and fatalities. Answers to questions about testing and the governor's stay-at-home order are available as well. For specific information about Prince George's, visit PrinceGeorgesCountyMD.gov. That's PrinceGeorgesCountyMD.gov. The site offers information about local services for residents and businesses. There's a link for COVID-19 relief donations. Also, food pantry locations are listed. And if you have any questions, call the county COVID-19 hotline at 301-883-6627. That's 301-883-6627. Welcome back. As we told you yesterday, one of the guests at Wednesday's inauguration was the chair of the Maryland State Democratic Party. Yvette Lewis was seated within feet of Biden, Harris, and three past presidents. It was an emotional moment for Lewis for many reasons. Like Kamala Harris, Lewis attended Howard University and is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. All I could think of was here's uh, little Yvette from Charlotte, North Carolina, you know, uh, grew up in the segregated South. Um, the product of two uh, college educated parents who worked very hard to make sure that I had the best uh, opportunities that they themselves did not have. And to see where I was, I felt that I had the my, my mother, my father, my grandfather, my grandmother, both of whom were college educated, beaming down with pride to say, this is all of the work that we invested in this child, and this is where she is. And I was proud to represent my family. I was proud to represent African-American women, my sorority. It was just immense pride. A slew of executive orders signed by President Joe Biden reverses anti-immigrant policies enacted under the Trump administration. One will provide a pathway to citizenship for undocumented people, including deferred action for childhood arrivals or DACA recipients. Trump ended DACA in 2017, but the the decision faced legal challenges and was eventually rejected by the U.S. Supreme Court. Immigrant advocates are celebrating Biden's action. And folks that have some kind of status like DREAMers who have DACA, for example, and individuals who are uh, protected under the temporary protected status and agricultural workers uh, will also be eligible to go down this path and even in a quicker ma manner. Um, so if you already have some kind of status, then that already pre-qualifies you 
to then um, apply for a green card and have permanent residency. You're an attorney, you work a lot with people who are in these situations. Uh, what are you hearing from people? Second to the city of Houston, Montgomery County um, hosts the largest number of, dr of dreamers um, nationwide. So a lot of folks that have DACA right now um, will have a path to permanent status. That, that's huge, that's huge because a lot of our dreamers, even though that, you know, they have DACA, it allows them to work, it allows them to, to educate themselves. Um, but if they wanna go on a semester abroad or if they wanna, if they wanna travel, they, it's really difficult unless you have a, a huge justification for that. There's no path to citizenship. So obviously this would open that up for dreamers. It would also open it up for uh, TPS holders. Biden also signed executive orders which ended Trump's travel ban against Muslim countries. He also rolled back deportation policies as well as attempts to exclude undocumented people from the census. A Colombian man faces federal charges for making social media posts threatening to destroy IRS headquarters. The suspect has been identified as 27-year-old Corey Moore. According to prosecutors, Moore posted on Twitter back on January 15th that he would bomb IRS headquarters. Moore also threatened to kill House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and law enforcement officers. If convicted, Moore could face a maximum up to 10 years in federal prison. Encouraging youngsters to have an active voice in government, the city of Mount Rainier recently lowered its voting age. If you're 16 years old, you can now cast your ballot in all city elections. The city council unanimously passed the measure earlier this month. I believe the earlier we get young people involved in, in, in what's going on in their communities and actually give them a voice so that they can have some say, the more likely they will be able and will continue to do that as they grow up and grow older. Mount Rainier isn't the only city in the county to lower its voting age. It joins Riverdale Park, Greenbelt, Tacoma Park, and Hyattsville. In other news, county police are investigating a fatal shooting in Langley Park last night. It happened in the 8100 block of the four, excuse me, of 14th Avenue. When police arrived, they found an unresponsive man suffering from trauma. The victim was pronounced dead on the scene. Anyone with information on this incident is asked to contact police. Meantime, four men are behind bars following a fatal shooting in Fort Washington. The suspects have been identified as Andron Wood, Keonta Haggins, Thetis Wills, and Quayshawn Reeves. They've been charged with first-degree murder. On Monday, police were called to the Food Zone store on Livingston Road for the report of a robbery. They found 66-year-old John Jang suffering from gunshot wounds. He was pronounced dead on the scene. The suspects are being held without bond. An American icon and Major League Baseball legend passes away. Hank Aaron died today at the age of 86. He reportedly suffered a massive stroke. Aaron, a Hall of Famer, is best known for breaking Babe Ruth's home run record in the 1970s. He received a lot of hate mail and threats as he approached that record. Meantime, during an interview with the American Academy of Achievement, Aaron talked about his passion for baseball. I gave baseball everything that I had. And that's the way I did every single night that I played or every day that I played. When I walked off that field, no matter where it was or when, I could walk in my hotel room and look myself in the mirror and say, hey, I gave it everything this afternoon that I had. Aaron played for the Atlanta Braves. Let's get a quick check on our three-day weather forecast tonight. Partly cloudy with a low around 26 degrees. Saturday, sunny with a high near 38 and a low around 23. Sunday, partly sunny with a high near 39 and a low around 30 degrees. Monday, cloudy with a chance of rain or snow in the morning. Daytime temps reach a high near 39 and a low around 31. And now for the community calendar. Here is a fun indoor activity for the family this weekend. This College Park Aviation Museum presents Engineering 101 Paper Plane Cargo Challenge. Gather materials, design your plane, and see if you have what it takes to win. The virtual event takes place tomorrow, January 23rd from 11 a.m. until noon. Register now. For more information, call 301-864-6029. And that wraps up our CTV News update. Join us again on Monday at 4.30 p.m. Have a good night.